Hello and welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey, broadcasting on all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world. We're bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and on TikTok. And folks, this is our 65th consecutive Good Evening Britain. So, cause for celebration. More cause for celebration is that we've got a great guest coming on at 7.30. That's David Scott of the UK column, a very well-respected alternative news broadcasting platform, the UK column. And David Scott is the UK column's Scottish correspondent, and he's always got a lot to say. And we're going to be talking about Alex Cole Hamilton and the Lib Dems. We're going to be talking about Air Miles, Angus Robertson, and we're going to be talking about who can we all vote for at the next general election. So that's going to be a really good conversation for 25 minutes with David Scott coming up at 7.30. Before then, we're going to talk about some various issues that we've been up to this week, and we'll also have our On This Day in British History. Great stuff, great stuff. Well, how is everybody keeping today, and what fantastic... Fantastic period of um, hot weather we've been having. Really, really nice. Very nice in Glasgow all of this week. Nice throughout Scotland and many places. Fantastic weather. Hope it's been as good for you as it's been for us here in the great British city of Glasgow. And it's still hot out there. It's still hot out there at 7 o'clock at night. First in was TC saying, Good evening all fellow unionists everywhere. Closely followed by... Debbie Beer, and from Adam, who always says hello from the heart of the great British state of England. Melissa says, hey, looking good. Thank you. Harry Brown says, evening, AFFG and unionists everywhere. Hope you're having a pleasant evening. Been seeing some videos saying the end of Scottish separatism on the internet lately. Good, good, good. Well, the are struggling, they're struggling, and the big problem that we'll be talking about in a moment is we hope that the Labour Party is not going to throw them a bone because whenever the SNP loses, the Labour Party throws them a big bone to help them get back on their feet again. We saw that immediately after the SNP suffered a catastrophic defeat in 2014 at the referendum, and the first thing that Labour did was to promise lots of new powers for the SNP which they promptly took and exploited and then complained that they didn't have them and created a big fuss about it. And the politics for about the next four years, five years, almost right up to COVID, were all as a consequence of the new powers almost that that the Labour Party had given. Or rather, it was the Tory party that had given it, but it was the Labour Party's idea. It was Gordon Brown's idea. And we'll be talking about Gordon Brown in a minute. So that's what we hope he's not going to do. We hope he's not going to throw the SNP a bone just at its time of failure. Hi, Stuart. Hope things are well with you. And to to Alan, we're going to be up in the great British city of Dundee this month. And Christopher says, what a glorious British summer here in Unionist Falkirk. Well, it absolutely is. Macaulay says, best wishes to all you British Unionists across our great union. A lot of positive, a lot of positive vibes in the house tonight. Christopher says, Labour are absolutely hopeless strategists. No idea at all. Well, I'm going to be getting into that. Let's get into that right now. As you know, I said last week that I was going to analyse Gordon Brown's 155-page policy document, which is really... What, the, what he wants the Labour Party to do if it were to get into power as far as devolution of power 
and changes to the Constitution is concerned. And so we did analyse it, and we analysed it in a 7,000-word document which we have printed on, published on our website. And that's called, it's called A Unionist Eye on Labour's Proposals to Devolve More Powers and Abolish the Lords. That was the snappiest title I could possibly come up with. A Unionist Eye on Labour's Proposals to Devolve More Powers and Abolish the Lords. And they're serious about this, okay? They'll maybe keep it quiet for as long as they can, but they're fairly serious about this. And if they were to be elected, then I do believe that they would get this straight through and they would start to make changes immediately. And whatever you may think about the House of Lords, it would definitely be goodbye House of Lords. And hello, an assembly of the nations and regions, the nations being Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and the regions being nine regions in England. And it would be a body of about 200 people who would be elected by a means still to be decided. They would be able to become ministers of uh, the cabinet in the way that uh, lords are not encouraged to do at present and they would each be representing their nations or their regions in very explicit ways so in other words it would be somewhat of a separatist talking shop but also a shouting and uh, arguing platform for everybody to see to try to make gains for themselves by seeing how they could defend their region or their nation against whoever happened to be the government of the day in the House of Commons. So really just setting up another arguing platform, another separatist platform in many ways as well, which is completely absurd when you think about it, because at the moment... The SNP boycott the House of Lords. They don't even have a voice in the House of Lords. But what Gordon Brown wants to do is to abolish the House of Lords and have an elected chamber where the SNP would, and Plaid Cymru would no doubt get quite a few assembly members into. And so just another platform for them to cause mischief. How is that benefiting anybody? What that is doing is it's going to give the... SNP another another platform and just at the moment when they're failing he's rescuing them and saying come in come in we've got a ready-made uh, benches and comfy seats here for you in this new assembly here in Westminster so we looked at that in our in our um, our article here well it's not an article it's actually a study Let's scroll to the top of it. A unionist eye on Labour's proposals to devolve more powers and abolish the Lords. And what we've done here is we've put it into chapter headings where we look at what's the fundamental premises of the report. We look more in depth at the second chamber. We look at the recommendations of the report and we give our seven conclusions and we say it's time to respect the unionist mandate. It's time to respect the union settlement. You know, this uh, Brown's document is full of his phrase, the, the devolution settlement. Well, what about the union settlement? How about hearing about the union settlement for a change? How about hearing about what the majority of us want? OK, we have a union settlement and we have a union mandate also. So let's be hearing that. And of course, in order to be constructive, in Appendix 1 here, we say what we propose instead. And we looked at some of the things that we proposed instead last week, and we expand upon them here. And then we look in depth, 10 reasons why an assembly of the nations and regions is a bad idea for the UK and bad for the Labour Party too. Because it's not going to do them any good whatsoever. And then Appendix 3, we're talking about a phrase that Gordon Brown's come up with, and he seems to be very proud of, called shared government. But as we say, shared government isn't necessarily a shared unitary government. 
After all, we used to have shared government with the EU. So we're just cautioning our people to remember that shared government is not actually a unionist phrase or a unitary idea. But anyway, we make it all very clear here. We make it all very clear. And um, I just want to quickly run down to the bottom. There's our seven conclusions summarized. One, the union has a right to protect itself. We have a union mandate. We have a union settlement. Number two, their plans to safeguard devolution are unnecessary and risk dissolving the union. Because what he wants to do, can you believe this? What he wants to do is to ensure that the second chamber, his new assembly, has a special power which enables it to prevent the government of the day from affecting a devolutionary bill or a devolutionary law or a devolutionary power in any way. If the government of the day wants to affect a change at Holyrood, then it has to get it past the assembly, his new assembly of the nations and regions. And that it will almost not fail to do because it will be in the interest of the Assembly to oppose the government of the day. For example, if there's a Tory government, there's going to probably be sufficient SNP, Labour, Lib Dem and Green people in the upper house, as it were, to prevent any kind of change. So, looking at what happened earlier this year with the, the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, okay, Alistair Jack was able to stop that very easily by just by just saying you're not doing it what gordon brown wants to do is to prevent that situation ever being able to happen again how is that possibly a unionist idea and so british governments of any stripe are going to be very reluctant to touch devolution in any way even if a devolved chamber is causing problems for the rest of the united kingdom the British government of the day is going to be very reluctant to touch that because it's going to have to have a fight, not with the devolved parliament, but it's going to have to have a fight with the upper house. And who's going to want that? So they're just going to let the devolution problem in the particular circumstance that might have arisen, they're just going to let it fester because they're not going to want a big fight with the upper house. So... It's it's not it's not a, a unionist position what he is advocating here. What it is is a federal position. And I'm pretty sure he's always wanted to move Britain towards being a federal nation, which is to say the the four parts of the United Kingdom are basically independent in virtually everything, except one or two highly controversial issues, like for example defence. Because one of the things that Gordon Brown says that is that, oh, if it can be done better at the local level, it should be done better at the local level. Well, I'm sure a lot of people in Scotland, Scottish nationalists, will say defence can be done better at a local level. There's a lot of Scottish nationalists that don't want Trident, for example. So they're going to say, you should be devolving defence just so that we can get rid of Trident. And then he's going to say, oh, no, defence is something that's better done at the British level, and they're going to say, well, why? You know? So, as I said last week, how close is close for these sorts of matters? And especially when you live on a small island, how close is close? It's always very close. It's always very close issues throughout the United Kingdom. This isn't like the United States of America, where if you want to go for a night out, you have to like travel for two days through the desert. You know, it's not like that. This is Britain. And I'm not joking when I say that about about America. I lived there for a little while and it was like, if you fancy contemplating a night out, it was like, you know, a nine hour return journey. And that was just to get to the nearest restaurant. Anyway, here Stuart says, bring back the Scottish office. Give it more powers, definitely. Catherine says, British Unionist Party, vote that, everyone in Scotland. Well, it's a good party. I would 
certainly recommend it as far as philosophy is concerned. I don't think they'll have that many candidates, though. They, I don't know. They might just be standing in two or three seats. Alan says, Gordon Brown really needs to take a step back now, doesn't he? Just my concern is that the Labour Party look on him as some sort of great Maimonides, you know, some kind of great Moses of the Labour Party. And so they go to him for, you know, the, the gen on virtually everything. And they'll be like, well, we don't know anything as London metropolitan types and academics, you know, in the Midlands or whatever. We don't know anything about Scotland, but Gordon Brown knows everything. So they'll just listen to what he's got to say and they will simply just uh, soak it up. Soak it up. They actually had, and as I say, they are serious about this because they had a rally, so-called, in the Central Hall in Edinburgh last Thursday. And we've got a picture of it here. And they got um, a few folk there, certainly. And you could listen to uh, Andy Burnham talking about local government in Manchester, if that was your bag. And they also had a woman mayor from somewhere in England Shire talking about, I don't know, something about local government, which must have been scintillating, really. It must have been amazing stuff. Anyway, all these people there sitting, listening to it, I'm presuming they're maybe local Labour Party members or members of the press or whatever. Anyway, OK, so they're serious. They're serious about this. And by the way, we're not getting a referendum on it either. That's that's clear in the report. He actually said all of this can be done very quickly. And he said it can all be done within the first, within the, the, the period of a Labour Party government, whether that's four years or five years. And there's no need, in their considered opinion, there's no need for a referendum on any of this. <laughs> in other words, they're just going to say, we put it in our manifesto and you voted for us, so that's a mandate for us to do it. And in a sense, they'll be able to justify that, because I'm afraid that's the way it works. Ryan says, the Parliamentary Labour Party are responsible for the constitutional instability with which the United Kingdom presently finds itself. I'm afraid you're right, Ryan. Christopher says, this penchant for devolution is the wrong way to go. It was from the very beginning. The time is now to cut it back. And that Brown is the only Labourite who has any ideas about Scotland. The trouble is they are the wrong ideas. Salmoned sturgeon, brown trout, something fishy, says Stuart. And you know, Cotton Brown does have the wrong ideas. He reminds me like some of these... Um, you know, the socialist types who say, oh, socialism's never been tried before. It's never worked. The reason it's never worked is it's never been done properly. And Brown takes that attitude and he applies it to devolution. Oh, the, dev the reason devolution doesn't work is because it's never been done properly. And I've written down here on my piece of paper exactly how it's all going to work. So all we need to do is just come into power and, and make a law to pass all of this and it will work. Now, he doesn't seem to realise that's not how politics works at all. The finest laid plans of mice and men and all that. And here is Tom Harris, who, who was a very sensible Labour MP here in Glasgow. He's no longer an MP. Writing here in the Telegraph of the 31st of May says... Devolution has been a disaster, yet Labour still hungers for more, as well put. And as he says here, the subsequent talking about um, devolution and the near wipe out of the Unionist parties at the 2015 general election. I was talking about that. That was immediately after the SNP had lost at 2014. They should have been way down. They should have been way down and struggling and torn and lost but Gordon Brown had given them a nice bouncy bed to to jump back on with the promise of more powers and the vow and that immediately just sent them rocketing back up the charts again. He says after the 2015 general election proved the skeptics case matters not a jot to believers in the one true religion of devolution the one true religion of devolution 
And another thing that Labour Party always do as well is in order to promote this devolution, they'll always talk about how awful the UK is. Well, the, in other words, they're just promoting what the SNP are saying. Like Mark Drakeford, who, in my opinion, is very much a closet separatist. He just didn't see a career with Plaid Cymru. He thought he could get into the Labour Party instead. And he essentially is a closet separatist. But Drakeford is, quote, leading the charge for a radical facelift to the UK constitution. That's what we're talking about here, Gordon Brown's ideas. Coining the phrase solidarity union to describe the next phase of decentralisation from Whitehall. Well, what they'll find with the Solidarity Union, and while that's a great idea, is to have solidarity, what they'll find is if they destroy the centre, then there's not going to be any solidarity flowing from it. As we say in our article, you have to have integrity and then purpose. You can't have purpose without having integrity at the centre. And if you destroy the integrity of the centre, then it's not going to be able to create any purpose for the rest of the UK. It's not going to be able to create a sense of solidarity because you will have destroyed the very centre itself. You'll have destroyed its existence itself. But as Tom Harris says here, shouldn't Drakeford... Sorry, he's talking here about um, a lot of public services were devolved as well as money to raise funds. But Drakeford is still complaining that that's not working and that's still complaining that it's because of the Tory government. And as Tom Harris says, but hang on, wasn't allowing domestic policy in Scotland and Wales the whole point of devolution? Shouldn't Drakeford be celebrating this rather than using it as yet another opportunity to criticise the UK? Such rhetoric will be warmly welcomed not only by Welsh's Labour nationalist partners in the Senate, Plaid Cymru, but by the Scottish National Party, which has prospered by expressing very similar anti-Westminster sentiments over the years. It was not the centralisation of power in Whitehall that led to the rise of the Nationalists or to the near breakup of the UK in 2014. It was the reckless constitutional vandalism wrought by Labour politicians in response to their own self-serving criticisms of UK institutions wrought by Labour politicians in response to their own self-serving criticism of UK institutions. And that's Tom Harris, a former Labour MP himself. This could all massively backfire on Labour. If you tell voters often enough and with the conviction that the likes of Brown and Drakeford inject into their oratory that the UK is a political basket case, then the public will believe in your own irrelevance which is not the wisest strategy for a party in search of a majority. Well said, Mr. Tom Harris. Now, we've got a guest coming up at in five minutes, and I see he's already in the green room. Before we have our guest, we're going to have our On This Day in British History Matters. On This Day in British History Matters. And it was on this day, on the 7th of June, 1925, that the Beaumont Hamel Newfoundland Memorial, a war memorial in France, was unveiled by Field Marshal L. Haig. And I'm interested in this because Newfoundland and Labrador is a province in Canada. And... During World War I, it was a dominion of the British Empire. It wasn't part of Canada. But at the outbreak of the war in 1914, the Newfoundland government raised a regiment of over a 1,000 men to fight in France for Britain and the Allies. And this memorial commemorates those who fought and died in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and those who perished in the battle on the first day of the Somme, when almost the entire regiment was wiped out at the fighting around Beaumont Hamel. That's the reason the monument is there. And that's a caribou on top of a rock which is looking out over the battlefield. And that's Prince Charles and Camilla back in 2016 given a tour of it on the 100th anniversary of the battle 
And so Newfoundland came into confederation with Canada, not until 1949, not until after World War II. And now the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is part of Canada. And I really like the Newfoundland flag, which they have. That's that's the flag of the province of Newfoundland. And as you can see there, it is built upon the concept of a Union Jack. And the the blue and white there from the, the saltire represents the 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 Scottish elements that were originally populated that area. The two red triangles, one represents Newfoundland and the other represents Labrador. And the gold arrow is pointing, according to its designer, pointing towards a brighter future. However, if you hang the flag vertically, and let's just turn that flag round, and you can hang it vertically at public events, and the arrow becomes a sword, which honours the sacrifices of the Newfoundlanders and the Labradorians in military service, in particular in First and Second World Wars. And also, you can think, according to the designer of this flag, you can think when it's hanging like that, that the bottom half represents a trident, symbolising the province's association with the fisheries and the sea. There you go. Okay, so that's the Newfoundland and Labrador flag and the memorial to the men of the Newfoundland regiment was unveiled on this day, 7th of June 1925 to commemorate almost their entire regiment being wiped out in the terrible battle of the Somme. Now we've got our guest coming up just in, in two minutes. Let's just read a couple of it. Adam says he bought his first Union Jack. Well done, Adam. You can't buy enough Union Jacks. We've got one here on the table. And you can buy one from us as well. If you'd like, this is our bespoke one. 3 by 2 Union Jack. It's got an open hem at the bottom here that you can put a, a flagpole into, including a tie as well. So this is a really quality, a quality Union Jack. And we'll put the link up there in the thread for you to for others to buy that yes Mark, uh, Mark I do agree that Brown did his bit in 2014 to keep the union together but at least a couple of his speeches did rouse the unionist troops and I agree that, that that he did well then and if that's all that he was doing I think that would be fantastic I think that he does articulate the union quite well to give him his due is when he tries to change things that he really just starts to cause problems. And Christopher agrees here, goes, that's true, but only because David Cameron was not particularly good at articulating it. Christopher says this is a highly recommended flag from us. He's got one. Now, folks, we have got the one and only David Scott of UK Column, and please say hello to David. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. Hello, how are you doing? Very well, David. Very well, thank you. And thanks for coming in. As always, I know that you're a, a firm favourite of the viewers here, especially because of your your insight into Scottish political matters. And you're the Scottish correspondent for the Alternative News Channel UK column. Would you call it Alternative News or maybe Truthful News? I don't know. Maybe Alternative's not the best how do you like well, to describe I mean, it? We always we we we're labelled the alternative media um, by what we would call maybe the legacy media or increasingly the Vichy media, your know, organisations like the BBC who are owned and operated by uh, well we're not quite sure what. Um, it, it's it's a very strange thing because within a certain part of our society um, or. Uh, organisations like UK Call, small though we are, um, ha have a very 
are, are, are kind of treasured. And um, we go along occasionally to, you know, marches and things. You know, there's a big one in London against the COVID lockdown. And the whole UK column team went along to it. And um, we just spent like four hours hugging people. The, yes, the yes. reaction is, 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 is very touching and very warm. And so within the, within the small subset of, of people in this country who are, shall we say, um, thinking, analysing things for themselves, who are, who are questioning the official narrative, um, they've kind of taken us to their hearts. And it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege uh, for us to be in that position. Whereas, oh, absolutely, yeah. Most people don't know that we exist, so this is it's a it's a it's a strange position. Um, so, alternative to to an extent, but what we're trying to do isn't alternative. What we're trying to do used to be called journalism. We're trying to bring analysis and insight, uh, truth and honesty, and form to to some extent an educational role. To some extent. Simply, uh, we're, we're a, a, an organisation that, that can discuss matters openly. And during, for example, COVID, that was a real boon to a lot of people because you couldn't go on the mainstream and, have, and, and hear a sensible discussion. You could only go on the mainstream and have um, mind-altering levels of fear transmitted at you the whole time. And simply because we weren't doing that, well, I guess that made us alternative at the time, but, you know, the, in, increasingly it's the mainstream that look alien um, to this country. That's a good point, an absolute good point. I just want to say to people on TikTok, uh, we're doing an interview here at the moment uh, on YouTube and Facebook and on Twitter. And so unless you're on those platforms, you won't actually see the interview. But... You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, Tucker Carlson got knocked off of uh, Fox News and he last night he did his first ever Twitter show, which was a, just a 10 minute broadcast. And oh, my, some of the stuff he was saying on it, he, he was covering all the bases. It was going from everything from the, the Ukrainian dam um, burst to 9-11, which I just mouth dropped open when he mentioned that. And uh, one or two other things, um, which, and and you said millions of views. It's like I don't know what I looked at it this morning. It's 125 million views, just wow. a 10 minute broadcast. Um, so it'll be more than that just now. Um, so incredible, incredible stuff. And <clears throat> who's who's watching the, these uh, the, the 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 legacy media as as you say. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. It's so good, though, that you're doing what you do at UK Column. And I know that some people, I know some people personally who watch and tune into you every day on, on Facebook or on your website. Good, good. Yes. Now, I know that <clears throat> you wanted to speak on a couple of matters today. And one of them involved something that the Liberal Democrat, Alex Cole Hamilton, um, mentioned and so what I suggest is we just play the video of just, Cole Hamilton we'll just go ahead and by means briefly, of introduction briefly yeah, yeah. But, yeah just a little bit of introduction um, <clears throat> this was greeted in a very strange way right? I'll just quote from the National because someone's got it a petition has been launched calling on the leader of the Scottish Liberal Dems to resign after he said Scotland quote can never and should never exist again, end quote. Now, this was one of the most egregious examples of lying from the National, because that is not what he said. What he said was far more interesting. And that's what I'd like to discuss with you t tonight. So, yeah, if, if you could play the clip, we'll, 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 we'll pick it up from there. I was talking about the clash of nationalisms. There are two nationalisms that have bedeviled Scottish politics for more than 10 years. There is, is of course, the, SN, uh, the Scottish nationalism of the SNP, but there's the Brexit nationalism of the UK Conservative Party. 
We are a people trapped between flags, between politicians who mythologize and pine for ancient nations that can never and should never exist again in the global world in which we find ourselves. Against those threats, those existential threats I defined at, the, at my outset. Now there is much to be ashamed of, of our common heritage in these islands. There are maps drawn by British cartographers which still spark wars in old colonial countries. But for all the darkness that lies in our wake, such light exists as well. In the Homes for Ukraine, the NHS, the BBC, the kinder transport. You know, the British people are a good and nurturing people, internationalist of outlook. So much in there to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> Everything from Brexit nationalism to the kinder transport. I had to look that up. So, so yeah, well, yeah, there is. There's a lot in there uh, to, to start. So, the the thing the Nash, the national was trying to sell was that Alex Cole Hamilton had said Scotland must not, should never exist again. What Alex Cole Hamilton actually said is that. A nation, their nation, any nation, including Scotland and Great Britain, should never exist again. Must be, must be consigned to the history books. And we live in a global world. And the reason that these nations are now, are now to be cast aside is we're now in a global world. They're, they're things of the past, right? They're ancient. They're, they're done away with. Right, so this is the quote. This is the quote unionist side. So this is the guy who's meant to be standing up to defend the concept of Britain. And he hates the concept of Britain. Now, I'd like to get into a little bit more about some of the other examples he showed. But that's, that's my main point. Alex Cole Hamilton and many, many people, certainly on the left, and even what we would now call the centre of British and Scottish politics, have completely sold out to the idea of globalism, right? that internationalism is, is a manifest good and nationalism is a manifest evil. That's the mindset. So the EU is good, the UN is better, right? and Britain is bad, and presumably Scotland is bad, or maybe worse, I'm not quite sure, and his position in the Scottish Parliament is to... Do what? It, um, it, it doesn't seem to me to be a, to be any round logic in his position. But that's the the basic idea: is internationalism good, nationalism bad, globalism good, um, localism bad. That's his idea. That's what he was putting forward. It wasn't an attack on Scotland. It was an attack on the very concept of there being such a thing as a nation. Good point. But, yes. So, yes. So, I mean, what, what, did, what, did, what did you make of that aspect of it? Well, I'll just read his quote again here. He said, We are a people trapped between flags, between politicians who mythologize and pine for ancient nations that can never and should never exist again in the global world in which we find ourselves. So as you quite rightly pointed out, he wasn't just talking about Scotland. He got it in the, the neck for as if he was talking about Scotland, but he was actually talking about Britain as a nation as well. And he's very clear about that. Um, because he 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 had a go at Scottish nationalism, but I thought it was interesting that he didn't say British nationalism. He said Brexit nationalism, which was a phrase I had never actually heard before. And I wondered why he said Brexit nationalism instead of British nationalism. But that was one thing that sort of um, surprised me in a way. But you're absolutely right in that he... His view of Britain, to the extent that it is, is one that sees that sees Scotland or Britain or whatever at the heart of the EU. So he's putting the EU as the goal, as the noble shining light at the end of the road that they're trying to that they're trying to reach, not not Scotland or Britain. And I thought is is he was wrong. Anyway, I mean, there's nothing wrong with mythologizing Scottish history if you want to. I mean, that's 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 uh, that's fine if that's your bag. It's not a bad thing necessarily to do that. Um, but it's all about it's all about globalism, and that's the that's the same. Even the SNP are highly globalist, even though they will mythologize uh, Scotland's past. 
the Scottish the, future that they want is one that's definitely part of the EU. Yeah. We'll, we'll come to the SNP in a minute because this next clip we've got it covers then. Just right. on Alex on, on Alex Cole Hamill. This is this is a man who's meant to be. He's part of the pro union side in Hollywood, right? So this is unfortunately this is what's defending your position in the parliament that's meant to represent you, right? And it's a, and it's a million miles from your position. Now, he then talks about, well, there's much to be ashamed. And he started off with shame. There's much to be ashamed of in the history of Great Britain. Ah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right? Now, right, now this, is, this is a very difficult one because it depends what you're comparing it to. If, you, if you're comparing it to the kingdom of God, yes, because we're a fallen people in a fallen nation and we're stiff-necked and there's a lot of problems. If you compare it to any other nation, not so much. Right? And I would, I would put it to you that compared to the other fallen peoples of the world, we actually had a, a, a pretty good record. Um, and then he, but he says, but there's light as well. And what does he give as an example of the light? Right? The policy with respect to the Ukraine war, the NHS, a Stalinist-based idea, which has basically been failing since the day now that it started and is con consistently in crisis. And the BBC, who <laughs> lie to us daily. That's, those are the points of light. So uh, what we did, where we drew the lines on the map, in other words, the role we played in being the global hegemonic power for not only over 100 years, but the most peaceful hundred years the world has ever known, which I think is a point that could be remembered here, mm. Mr. Cole Howard. Mm. All right. If we don't like war and we think killing people's bad, the British Empire was very good compared to every other human effort at providing a, 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 a hegemonic power. All right. And against against that, against you know the um, decades long campaign to end slavery, the um, ensuring freedom of the seas, ensuring free trade, um, bringing bringing um, law, bringing the idea of equality before the law, um, and bringing the idea of discussion and, and and not brutality to many many parts of the world. Against that which he likens as darkness. On the positive side, we've got the BBC, uh, the <laughs> promotion of the Ukraine war, and the NHS. So you, you see the intellectual bankruptcy of the position. This is what happens if you sell out intellectually. You, you, no, sell out's wrong. That's unfair to Mr. Cole Hamilton. I don't think he's sold out. If you're intellectually crushed, demolished, subdued by, by lies... If you don't have the patient's integrity, guts, insight, discernment, I don't know what, all of that, I suspect, to stand up against the lies and take them on. If you think, well, I'll, I'll go along with the lies because everyone believes the lies, so I'll surrender to the lies. I'm now on the side of the masses. And I believe all these things, even though they're not true you're left intellectually bereft and you cannot form a coherent argument because that was not a coherent argument. That's my no, point. no, I didn't find it a convincing argument whatsoever. Um, apparently, he, the Lib Dems actually did win the debate. Um, but then again, they were up against, he was against Alex Salmon, so I don't know what the, the quality of the debate was like. But, but yes, it's not an intellectual argument. It's not somebody you would want to put forward and say, this is the man that's going to make the case for, you know, for Britain, as it were, exactly. So, and uh, also wearing a kilt. Quite frankly, I thought that was trying too hard, and it wasn't fitting him properly either. It was like below the knees and everything. It was just, it, was, it just looked terrible. Yeah. The whole thing was just like, oh my goodness me, don't do that again. So, so that's that's the quote unionist sign, and for balance, right? Because you know, like the BBC, you know. Uh, I've also got a clip from the nationalist side, which in its own way is every bit as extreme. This is um, Angus Air Miles Robertson. Some nicknames just work. 
So <laughs> Angus Ayr Miles Robertson talking about what it is to be a Scot. So it's the same area, but we're, it's a different aspect, but we're still talking about the, the nature of being in a nation, what okay. it is to be a member of the nation. Right? So for Alex Cole Hamilton, it's a shameful thing that has to be consigned to the past. Right? So here we've got the allegedly Nationalist Party, and we all know there's no such thing, they're an internationalist party, the SNP. Grandee now of the SNP, although he wouldn't run for leadership, probably quite wisely. Um, talking about the Scottish diaspora and what it is to be a member of the Scots diaspora. Okay. Somebody who lived abroad myself for a decade, I understand the pull of home and desire to celebrate and gather with other like-minded diaspora Scots. And this is why we've decided to expand our approach to adopt a broad an inclusive definition of diaspora. We want to strengthen and expand Scotland's links, not only with those of Scottish heritage, but also to include people who've lived in Scotland for any reason. This includes alumni of Scotland's world-leading educational institutions, those who lived and worked in Scotland, including our fellow Europeans who came here under European Union freedom of movement and contributed so much to our country. And Scotland's relationship with Europe remains strong. The Caledonian Society of France celebrated its centenary in 2022. There's a Scotland hub at the University of Mainz promoting Scottish culture. Diaspora and community is one of the priority areas in the Ireland-Scotland joint bilateral review. And beyond that, we will reach out to those with a professional, a business, cultural or other links to Scotland, our affinity diaspora. Expanding our definition of diaspora means that we must work across many geographies. Tens of thousands of students from China, from India, from Nigeria, the United States, and many other countries besides, over 82,000 of them alone in 2021-22 benefit from Scotland's world-class universities. For crying out loud, that's, that's, uh, I'm just making some notes there. That's, that's that's broadening the definition, as he said, quote unquote, broadening the definition to virtually the entire world. To the entire world, right? So if you, <laughs> if you're sitting in, if you're sitting in Nairobi, but you have once ordered an uh, online and purchased a Tunnock's tea cake, you are part of the Scots diaspora. Uh, if you've, if you've been the low cost mini break to Inverness, you're part of the Scots diaspora. If you've been in a stag night in Edinburgh, you're part of the Scots diaspora. Where does he draw the line? There is no line. Now, if, you're if, English, every... if, you're, if you're English, the English people who have come up on holiday and then gone back, they're not part of the diaspora. It's the Chinese, the 82,000 Chinese last year who, who were at the well, university. Well, I mean, he, he, he doesn't. He's part of the SNP. So, frankly, you know how, you know, the, the, the faulty towers don't mention the war. The SNP don't mention the English because th mm. this is a difficult area. Um they're, they're not really they're not really comfortable with the concept of the English, um, so yeah, he, he chooses he chooses Africans and Chinese as the examples, but the logical extension is everyone in England who comes for a holiday in Scotland that well they've now lived in Scotland yeah because mm. he doesn't give a there's no timeline there's no, no, no. minimum <laughs> period, um, so that's part of the Scottish diaspora. Anyone essentially who identifies, this is like the trans ideology, anyone who identifies as a Scot becomes a Scot. Mm -hmm. Just yes. anyone who identifies as a woman becomes a woman. And, it, and, and what this is an is an attack on the very identity of what it is to be a Scot. And this it, it destroys the very thing he's allegedly speaking to um, to raise up. And he's doing this, again, it's the same sellout, it's the same intellectual sellout. It's the same surrender to false ideas, essentially um, Marxist, cultural Marxist ideas. One of the things they have to do is destroy the nation. The other, another one, and a related one, is to destroy the family. And another related one is to destroy the church. So you can't believe in anything and you can't identify with anything in a real way that matters, but you identify with everything in a funny way that, that, that doesn't matter, mm -hmm. um, that's fake, that's false, that's empty. So you negate the real because there is a nation called Scotland and it does have a history and 
that is that history is very very interesting and uh, ethnically it's it's tied up it's the same people ethnically as the people that we call english and that whole issue is a fascinating example of how people migrated and how people traveled across the continent to to come here and that's a that's a fascinating story and it's only part of the story um and all of that it doesn't matter what mm. matters is what you feel if you feel you're a scot you're a scot you 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 know you you had you bought some shortbread in an airport lounge you you scot you're part of the scots diaspora congratulations now, <laughs> now i know that he probably wouldn't use either walker shortbread or tonics tea cakes as an example because they're both union supporting companies but the, to be fair to the SNP, it's difficult to find a Scottish company they don't detest. So mm. that's, a, that's a problem. So it's, it's making the idea of, of, of being a part of a nation, in this, in this term Scots, so watered down as to be meaningless. Now, there's a very interesting aspect here because the diaspora, the Scots diaspora has a problem for the SNP. Because under Nicola Sturgeon, and I ch challenged her and got this, it was like, a, it was like hitting a replay in a tape recorder, I got this response to find what's, what is Scottish, to find a Scot, right? And it came out, anyone who lives in Scotland is committed to Scotland. It was like she'd learnt it and it replayed. And that yeah. meant two things. It meant magic dirt, anyone who lives in Scotland, so the, the, somehow the soil is, 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 makes, you, makes you Scottish somehow, right? Completely unhistorical because if you read the Declaration of Our Birth, we were Scots when we were in, uh, coming along the Mediterranean. We were Scots when we were in Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula, and we were Scots when we were in Ireland. Right? The, 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 it wasn't magic dirt, but Nicola doesn't read the Declaration of Our Birth. Um, she reads feminist novels. Um, so that, that, um, that kind of... Um, I, I, got away from the idea of what it is to be Scots because the diaspora speaks to the bit that the nationalists are terrified to go near, which is the idea of blood. It, you're talking about an extension of the family. You're talking about something you're born into. You can join, right? It's not, it's not entirely exclusive, but for the most part, you're born into and the blood and the inheritance and the, na the nature of the nation actually has value. And, now, and this is, this is <clears throat> the, the, he's trying to get away from that. That's, that's a good point. And I'm glad that you, you said that. They're basically just trying to change the definition of the diaspora from something that traditionally it's been Scottish people of Scottish heritage. And that is too close to the bone it's too politically incorrect, so it's let's just change that. Like like what they used to, what they did, and two years ago they changed the definition of a vaccine from what most of us thought it was to something that it's completely new. They're just changing the definition here. When words don't fit the world that they're trying to bring in, when words don't fit the policy that you're trying to promote, then just change the definition of the word. Let's just say diaspora is everybody, as you say, who's basically had any kind of, um, you know, if you've been sitting in. Um, I don't know, uh, Mogadishu, and you Googled uh, a Force for Goods website, you've got a connection with Scotland now, so you're part of the diaspora. Maybe that's just the way it works. David, we're almost at the top of the hour here, so we're going to have to bring the the conversation to to what? an end. Um, but let me just give you a shout out. You're at twitter.com forward slash UK column, and you're also at facebook.com forward slash UK column. And you're personally at twitter.com forward slash Albion underscore Rover. And your website is ukcolumn.org. And you guys are broadcasting on those platforms every day, every day. ukcolumn.org is the main one to go to. And out of that, you'll get all the, the other things. Anything, this has been a very fast half hour, David. Anything that you want to just wrap up in the last couple of minutes? Yeah, just a, a final word. The nation is an extension of the family. The idea that you can love your family without hating other families is too obvious to need stating. 
All right? And the same applies to the nation. You can love your nation without hating other nations. You can love your nation without objecting to members of other nations marrying into yours and welcoming them, well, and welcoming them in as part of what is now yours. It can be expansive, it can be warm-hearted. Um, but ultimately, it is real, it does have value, it will endure. And that people who are simpler and wiser than either Mr. A. Miles Robertson or Alex Cole Hamilton realise this. They realise it, perhaps instinctively, they realise it because they live it, they realise it because they, they recognise the nation as something which they value very dearly. The attempt, I thought your comment about the, the, the attempt to change the meaning of words was extremely astute. That is exactly um, what Mr Robertson was trying to do there. He was trying to move the definition uh, to get away from what it actually means because he can't face it. Mm. And um, what you see here is further examples of intellectual collapse under the weight of lies that they're trying to carry and what we need to do to fight against that is to painstakingly and gently and accurately point out the truth. Exactly, exactly. And pointing out the truth is something that you and the team at UKcolumn.org are doing every day. David, thank you very much for the half hour that you've been with us. And thanks again for your, your thoughts uh, well, on all, all of those matters which were very well articulated. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Once again, it always flies past the time we sp I spend on your programme. It always goes, seems like just a few minutes. It, it's, it, I really enjoyed it again, so thank you very much for having me, Alistair. Hopefully I can join you again in the not-too-distant future. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll get that arranged. Okay then, David. Good night. Good night. Fantastic. Fantastic. David Scott of UK Column, thanks for the the points that you were making. Um, I saw a funny comment there. Um, not Scott's diaspora, but Scott's diazepan sounds better. Ken <laughs> uh, says, fascinating insights as always. Nelson says, another top show. Alistair, fantastic guest again. Thank you, Stuart, for your humour. Christopher says, excellent stuff, David, as does Catherine. Good. Well, we'll be back. Um, next week, we've got a guest. It's Liz Phillips, who is organising a conference in Wales called The Great Resist. And she'll be telling us all about that next week. So looking forward to hearing what she's got to say about that. Um, folks watching on TikTok, you don't get to see the interview, unfortunately. You only see that on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. But it just remains for me to say thanks, folks, for all your comments. It's always great to see you. We'll see you next week. And so it just remains for me to say God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King. See you next time. <laughs>